Before I start, I have a few questions for you. Um, how many of you have attended the webinar series on Open Phone? How many of you knows how to use Open Form? 50%? How many of you have never tried to run an Open Form case? Percent? Uh, 25? And how many of you don't have experience doing simulation, multi-physics simulation of nuclear reactors? You all, okay, you. I can assume the others have done some level of modeling and simulation involving neutronics and thermal hydraulics. And maybe the last one, how many of you have experience with CFD? Okay, thank you. Um, so for those of you who have attended the Open Form webinar series, this is gonna be very similar almost the same as the first lecture of that webinar. That doesn't mean, so if the slides are the same, that doesn't mean the lecture has to be the same. So this is in person, so you are more than welcome to interrupt me and we can make it interactive. So if you don't understand something, something is not clear or you want an additional clarification, please raise your hands and stop me. This is the advantage of being here in person and seeing me, I see you and you can stop me. Um, so this first lecture, okay, I can do this here, right? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, so this first lecture is gonna be about a general introduction to open form. Um, mainly about examples of how people have used open form in the past because this will give you an idea on how you can use it for your own purposes. Uh, and that will be the part that I will um, discuss. And then the second part, Stefan will do it and it will more be about how to approach a new problem and the lessons learned in the last 15 to 20 years of use of open form. Something I forgot to mention, I'm not sure I can go back, can I go back with this? Nope. Nope. Can only go forward. Oh yeah. I have to double click apparently. Uh, so in, it will be Stefan and myself who will present this, but I, I need to acknowledge Ivor Clifford who uh, made substantial contribution to the preparation of the slides for the webinar. Um, so open form, what open form is, if you go on the web and you look for open form, you'll see that it is described as an open source CFD toolbox. It is, and it has capabilities that mirror those of commercial CFD. It's free to use, uh, you don't have to pay, and you have access to the source code. And it has a large user base, very arguably is the most successful open source CFD tool that you'll find out there. The user base is really big. We speak about 10 to 20,000 uh, engineers and scientists worldwide, uh, way beyond nuclear. So open form is used in aeronautics, automotive, um, maritime engineering. Um, you will find fellow foamers pretty much everywhere uh, you go. Despite being uh, called the CFD toolbox, luckily open form is more than that. Um, open form stands for open field operation and manipulation. You may understand from that that it's not just a tool, it's a library. And it's actually a very good, very large, very well organized HPC scalable C++ library for the solution of partial differential equations. With open form you can solve whatever partial differential equation you want. Um, in addition to that, it's not just, you know, you will find out there are libraries that allow you to discretize something. You look into open form, you will realize quickly that it's a large library. Uh, it's more than a million lines of code and in there you find a lot of functionalities like solution of ODE, uh, projection algorithms, mesh search, octree, you have a very efficient octree mesh search, um, you have finite area methods, there's a lot in there. So pretty much everything you want, you will find it in there. Other interesting thing is object oriented um, with a very high level fail safe API 
what I mean by that. Um, you know, if, if we want to solve partial differential equation, this is the way we write a partial differential equation in mathematics, right, or engineering. Uh, so it, this is the turbulent kinetic energy equation. I took it because there's a lot of operators in there. So you have time derivative, you have the divergence, you have a Laplacian, uh, and you have a source. And this is the way you write it in engineering mathematics. Um, nice thing about OpenFOAM, the whole programming is made it so that at least at a very high level you can mimic the same equation. So you don't have to program your own discretization. You can literally say for a derivative over time it's going to be a DDT. A divergence is going to be a div. A Laplacian is going to be a Laplacian. Um, what's PVM? Finite volume method. Right? So you're saying I want a derivative over time, I want a divergence, and I want these things to be uh, discretized using finite volume. Um, I think it's VVM is actually finite volume matrix. Um, you will find also VVC, which is computation. That depends if you want a matrix or if you want a source term. Um, so nice thing in general about open form is that at the very high level there is an obvious correspondence between equation and equation, so equation and programming. If you go deeper down in open form, it will get more complicated, but still you have object-oriented, it's well-programmed, it's been professionally programmed since the beginning. Um, you will very rarely see, t see things like the use of acronyms, which is not a good practice. Most of the time, the variables are named after, with names that are understandable. If you have an alpha for a porosity, you will see alpha. You will not see things like al or alf, you will see alpha. Or if you have a porosity, most of the time you will see porosity and not uh, p. Uh, it's very easy to understand. And it's subject-oriented, which means all pieces of programming are pretty much independent. You can touch part of a code without affecting all the rest. And you can understand that when you have one million lines of code, that is pretty much necessary. You cannot have a monolithic piece of code. Uh, sorry. Now, it's a library, but it's still a CFD toolbox, and this is nice. It means, you know, you will find out there are numerical libraries that will allow you to, you know, solve whatever you want, except that if you want to solve whatever you want, you have to build the whole thing. Nice thing about OpenFOAM is that it comes with 50, probably, solvers already available, professionally developed, tested, validated, verified, uh, for a lot of things, and most of the time it's thermal hydraulics because it's a CFD toolbox, which is a good thing because you will quickly realize that CFD, numerically speaking, is one of the most complicated things you may want to solve. So having that part that is already taken care of, both for single phase and two phase and very different formulation of two phase, this is a very good feature. Um, but there's more than that. You will find in there electromagnetism, Monte Carlo, stress analysis, even finance. Uh, so you find a number of solvers. And I said before, we have 10 to 20,000 engineers working with this, which means you will find solvers developed by the community. A lot of them. I mentioned one here, uh, which I think is very relevant. It's called Solids for Foam. It's developed by the University of Dublin. Uh, and it is a very large set of solvers and a very big library about solution of general nonlinear mechanics, uh, which you understand from previous slides. You don't have much of that in open form, but you have a very good library that has been developed for more than a decade uh, that you can use to do thermal mechanics. Um, I also mentioned open form has a lot of functionalities. Um, this is essential. If you want to do multi-physics, you want to have a library that allows you to pull functionalities instead of developing new ones all the time. Developing new functionalities can be extremely time-consuming and may require expertise that you don't necessarily have. Um, with OpenFOAM, you find most of what you need in multi-physics. Especially, you will find mesh-to-mesh -mesh projections, which are strictly necessary if you want to do multi-physics. You will find dynamic meshes, uh, which can be very useful in certain applications. For instance, sodium fast reactors, if you want to simulate um, expansion of your core, 
due to thermal deformations, it's good to have possibility to move your mesh. Or if you want to do field behavior, and Alessandro will mention that, it's good to have the possibility to move a mesh. You have ODE solvers, which can be useful if you want to do point kinetics, for instance. Uh, you have finite area method, which can be useful in some cases. For instance, if you have fuel behavior and you want to simulate your fluid along the surface without having to simulate fu full CFD, you can use a finite area method. You have Monte Carlo, you have Lagrangian particle tracking, um, and this is just mentioning a few. Uh, once again, in one million lines, you find a lot of functionalities. And again, you have the community out there. So you will find functionalities that have been developed by the community and that are on top of what is distributed with OpenFOAM. The obvious uh, project to mention here is Foam Extend, uh, which is a very large uh, sibling project compared to OpenFOAM, uh, where you can find a lot of um, libraries. Years ago, I started working on reduced order modeling, and I found in there a library for pro proper orthogonal decomposition. So I didn't have to develop anything, it was there. And that spared me months of work. So if you put everything I said together, you realize that you have a very large set of solvers and functionalities. You have a modular co-structure with a high-level API, uh, object-oriented programming. Something I haven't mentioned, but you have quality control. Um, ESI version of OpenFOAM is developed according to ISO 9001. And you have state-of-the-art nu numerics, something I haven't mentioned, but OpenFOAM scales pretty much as any other CFD toolbox out there. Uh, so pretty well, not extremely well. If you want to go to exascale, we have a problem, but this is not an OpenFOAM problem, this is a CFD problem. Most of the algorithms we use these days are not ready for exascale, especially finite volumes. Um, many people are working on that, but we cannot say that we can easily do exascale with finite volumes these days, or finite elements for that matter. It's just most of the algorithms that have been developed in the last 50 years do not vectorize well, which means you cannot use them easily in GPUs. You have to modify the algorithm, and that takes a while. It requires basic research in computational science. Now I will give you, before giving the word to Stefan, I will give you some example of things that have been done in the past. I have to say that a lot of this content has been taken from, from a paper, which I believe is open access, and that you can find on uh, Science Direct, on nuclear engineering and design. And co-authors are myself, Ivor Clifford again, and Stefan and Stefan. So you have three out of the four co-authors here if you have to ask questions. So, a little bit of a history of using of open phone. At least how I know it. Maybe there are things I'm not aware of, uh, in which case, if you are aware of them, you let me know. But the first activity I'm aware of about use of open phone in nuclear engineering dates back to the early 2000s in South Africa. And that was during the PBMR project. Um, they quickly realized that it was difficult to do PBMR analysis using legacy codes with structured meshes and uh, mostly prepared for mm, single heterogeneity cores and not double heterogeneity cores. And they decided to start develop a tool and they decided to use OpenFOAM. Um, fortunately, PBMR project um, died out, um, hopefully not because of OpenFOAM. Um, but open form use from multiphysics survived. Uh, it was brought to the US by Ivor Clifford, actually. Uh, did his PhD at Penn State and develop, kept developing models for HTR, prismatic in this case. But it's only in between, let's say, 2010 and 2015 that we start seeing a widespread use of open form in the nuclear community. And I think the community that drove uh, that expansion was the molten salt reactor community. At the same time, we saw uh, work on uh, SFRs and FHRs and various activities about modeling of advanced reactors. Between 2015 and 2020 and now, we st <coughs> started seeing some persistent development. So not just PhD studies that died out after the student finished his PhD, 
but research group that committed to maintaining and keep developing and verifying and validating a specific tool. I'm aware of at least three tools that are out there that have been maintained, developed, and are still maintained and developed for more than four, five, six years. And the three of them will be presented in, the, in this workshop. One is Chenform, Reactor Multiphysics. One is Fuel Behavior, is Offbeat for Fuel Behavior. Um, I should say for fuel behavior in general in nonlinear thermal mechanics, because offbeat, Alessandro will probably mention that, but you can use it for simulating a vessel or simulating a graphite core. It's pure nonlinear thermal mechanics. And the fact that we use it for fuel behavior is just a very specific application of nonlinear thermal mechanics. And there's containment flow foam that is for containment flows, and Stefan will mention will discuss that uh, I think on Thursday, right? So I will not spend much time on these tools because we will present them extensively in the next few days. I will spend some words about, you know, work that led to tools like Genfoam and Offbeat. And this was the PBMR project. As I said, the purpose back then, it was to develop something for PBMRs, for HTGR. <clears throat> and the idea was to have something that was 3D, a structured mesh, parallelized, extensible. Um, and one of the quick key questions at that time, do we have some water? I'm kind of, yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry. Better. So one of the key questions at that time was, can we use a library like OpenFOAM for neutronics? In 2020-23, you may find that is obvious. In 2003, it was not. I mean, you have to go back to 2003 and realize that tools at that time were mainly nodal codes specifically done for neutronics, structured meshes, using very specific methodologies like nodal methods optimized for square or hexagonal geometries, and all of a sudden, they wanted to do structured meshes with finite volumes and segregated, meaning not all coupled in the same matrix. It was not obvious at all. Um, luckily, the answer to the question, can we do that, was yes. And it was actually fairly straightforward. First of all, because the implementation was straightforward, thanks to open form. It's like DDT, flux, minus, lablation of a flux, and you do it a certain number of times, and you have multi-group. And then you exchange terms and you have coupled neutronics. Um, so the implementation was fairly straightforward and the solution turned out to be fairly, uh, well, actually very um, so, uh, robust. They, it converged pretty much, it didn't have problems. So the answer was positive. It was possible to do neutronics with, gen, with open form and it was 20 years ago. Um, after that, um, Another thing that was done more like 13, 12 years ago, instead of 20, was use of open foam for something that is closer to open foam, so um, thermal hydraulics. But open foam at that time was mainly um, CFD, so fine mesh CFD, um, RANS or LES. Well, I would say in 2010, probably mainly RANS. Um, and this was Again, work from Ivor Clifford, he has been really a precursor for open form. Um, he paved the way for many of the activities that have been done with open form. Um, and what he wanted to do was to develop a multi scale um, solver uh, for HTR, prismatic HTRs. You know, HTRs, they, are, they tend to be multi scale by nature. You have uh, a very large core with uh, prismatic elements. Inside the prismatic elements you have uh, fuel and graphite and inside the fuel you have triso. It can be very complicated. If you want to reconstruct the whole thing, um, at that time most of the people were doing very simple homogenization. And he decided, no, I want to do more than that. And he decided to do real multi-scale using reduced order model. And you will find people like three, four years ago that will, that have proposed this kind of techniques. But keep in mind, this was done in 2011. This was way before other people started doing that. And why was it possible? Well, 
because Ivor is a brilliant person and because OpenFOAM helps a lot. Um, you already have CFD solvers and going from CFD to coarse mesh, porous medium, you just have to add the porosity and some source terms. Um, you can easily tailor equations to add source and sink terms. Sorry about that. Um, and you have a lot of functionalities and one of the functionalities was proper orthogonal decomposition. So if you want to do a multi-scale and you want to do it in a rigorous way and you want to do it in a way that the lowest scale can be solved in a time that is reasonable for the highest scale, well, you may want to use reduced order. And one of the ways to do reduced order, sorry again, it's proper orthogonal decomposition and there was a library for that. So you can understand how having a library that already provide you with the CFD solver and already provide you with a lot of functionalities can make your life easy. You don't have to redevelop everything from scratch because trust me, if you want to do this thing starting from scratch or from a library that just provides some level of discretization, well, this is a multi-person project from multiple years, not a PhD thesis. Um, now I would like to open a little parenthesis. Um, for something that is gonna be useful for the coming days, um, and something that is useful for you to understand how to use open form. Imagine you want to do, again, imagine you want to do thermal hydraulics of a reactor core. You can do CFD, right? Very few people do that. Why? Because it's very computationally expensive. And it's not so worth it because most of the time you have a very repetitive geometry. And it turns out that if you have, you use correlation for pressure drops and Nusel number, they give you potentially better number than um, CFD, especially if you have things like sub-cooled nucleate, uh, sub nucleate boiling. Doing that with CFD, yeah. if you have a good correlation, you're gonna have good results. So CFD can be used, but it's not often used in our field. What we know that people use very often is uh, system codes, Subchannel codes, right? Now, if you look at what people do when they use finite volume or finite elements library, is that they use something called porous medium approaches. You look at what they do in Moose, it's porous medium. You look at what we do in OpenFOAM, it's porous medium. Uh, why is that? Well, first of all, you can find on books, um, Todras and Kazimi, I think it's, you can find the derivation. You can prove that sub-channel and system codes are um, a specialized verso, version of porous medium. So porous medium is actually a generalized version of sub-channel codes and system codes. How do you obtain um, porous medium? Well, you start from Navier-Stokes. You do volume averaging. I will not do it here today. You do a volume averaging of your equations. And what you will find out is that you find the same equations, Navier-Stokes equations, with an addition, which is a porosity term, it's just telling you not all the volume is occupied by your fluid, only a fraction of it, and that is described by this gamma, which is porosity. And the other thing you will find out is that there are additional terms there, F and Q, um, that are essentially describing the interaction of your fluid with the structure that you're not describing anymore. They are describing uh, pressure drops and the heat transfer with the structure. So you will find pretty much the same equations. You can prove that you can find these equations. You can use these equations to do sub-channel if you want or to do system code if you want. Nice thing is, is that you're using the same set of equations you were using for CFD. So when you use tools like OpenFOAM or Moose, this is a very nice set of equations you can implement in your tool to use the same capabilities of the tool, but to be able to do nuclear typical approaches like sub-channel or system level analysis. It's all in the same set of equations. And another nice thing about these equations is that if you enter, you go from a core that you're treating as a porous medium and you get out into a plenum, porosity goes to one, the other terms, the source term goes to zero, so you fall back immediately to a standard CFD approach and you do not need to do the coupling between core and plena using a separate interface that always blows up. Very easy, the tool will do everything itself in the same matrix, you will have the core and the plena, no problem of stability, no problem of numerical diffusivity. You can so solve for a whole entire primary circuit in the same mesh. 
Now, the reason why I said that is partly to introduce you to something we will use the next days, partly because I was speaking about open form and how easy it is to you know, implement a question in open form. But I wanted to use this to give you a warning, which is, imagine you are using, you're solving for um, the momentum equation. And uh, you have something like this. And you may be tempted to say, okay, I can solve it. I have DDT, DDT, I have divergence, I write divergence. I have a Laplacian, I put a Laplacian. And I have a gradient and I put a gradient. Well, you do that, it will never solve. You can trust me. You can try it, it will never solve. The real way you solve it is actually this one. Uh, the DDT pretty much remains a DDT, but then you have uh, corrections for continuity errors. You have a rearrangement of the divergence uh, to separate the linear, uh, the uh, diagonal and non-diagonal term and you have a rearrangement um, of the pressure contribution so that it fakes a stagger grid. This is not meant to discourage you. This is meant to tell you, look, if you want to do, to use open form or MOOS or whatever library to do uh, multi-physics, you will have to know your problem. And you will have to know, or you will have to do research and realize that when people do CFD, they don't solve the equations like I showed you before. They solve the equation like this. You go into ANSYS, you will find this. You go into CFX, you will find this. The reason is, is that historically people have worked on this. They found out this is the way to solve for this equation in an accurate and stable way. So having a library that allows you to throw in equation doesn't mean you can throw in equation and get a solution. Unfortunately, you will have to do some research, realize how to feed equations to the library and then solve them. Um, so I think it's important to tell you this because otherwise you will enter a loop of frustration where you try to feed equation and say, eh, open form doesn't work. And then you say, eh, does open form doesn't work? Then I use moves. Then you will use moves and you will say, eh, moves doesn't work. And then you will end up using system codes and hopefully they will work and most of them they have the same problem. So. Just be careful, know that you will have to know what you do if you want to um, obtain solutions. So, one needs familiarity with the problem. Um, nice thing is that OpenFOAM will often help you out because for a situation like this, as I said before, you will already have the CFD solver. So pretty much you will have the whole thing, the only thing that you will miss is the porosity and uh, additional terms like FSS and QS that simulate you know, the interaction with subscale structure. So you will have most of the thing that is done, you will have to add a few terms. And again, it's open form. You will have contribution from the community. You look at the community, what they have done, you will find out that someone did GenFOM. You look at GenFOM, you will find this set of equation already available. Do you have to use open GenFOM? No, you can take this thing, bring it to your own solver if you want to develop your own solver and use it. And with this, I'm not you know, suggesting to each time redevelop the same solver. Honestly, I've seen diffusion solver in open form developed at least five or six different times. And you can find at least three, four publications out there about diffusion in open form. So please don't do that. If you find a solver out there, use it. And use your time to improve the thing and you know, give it back to the community so that we can all advance in the same direction instead of trying to compete on the same solver because we think that maybe we can do it better. Maybe you can do it better, but out of that 100% of the time, 95% of your time will be used to catch up with what other people have done, which is, I believe, a waste of our time. So if you find something out there, my suggestion is get in touch with the developer um, if it's not available. Otherwise, if it's available, maybe you know, just shoot an email to the developer and say, yeah, we want to use that and use it and start from there you will realize that although it may, be sim may feel simple to redevelop your thing, it's gonna take much more time. Uh, Nicoletta was speaking about best practices in React and nuclear um, code development, open source nuclear code development. So we have been you know, working on that for several years now. We have interviewed several experts and we found out one interesting fact is that if you start developing a tool the usual time frame, you may feel like you will finish it in a PhD, you will most likely not. The usual time frame that came out from people developing open form solvers, MOOS, 
Salome, it's a five year plus five year, more or less. You will need five years to develop your tool and make people that know that your tool exists. And at least five other years to consolidate the thing and make it enter international projects. And that is about tools that have been successful. Because you also have to consider that maybe four out of five, they die after a PhD, not because they were not good, but simply because there was no continuity in the institution. Maybe the institution doesn't have the interest or the money to make the project survive. So think carefully before you know, starting a new thing from scratch. And my suggestion is always, if you can use what's out there and try to improve it, if you can, give it back to the community so that we can all go in the same direction. So with this uh, parenthesis, um, I'm slow. Um, I wanted just to mention a few other examples of use of open form. So I mentioned before, MSR modeling is probably the field that has brought open form to the attention of the community. And there is a good reason for that, is that um, when I speak about MSR at the beginning it was mainly molten salt fast reactors, because that was really the case where we could not use legacy tools. There's no way. I mean, if you want to solve this thing and you don't do CFD, you are not solving this thing. As simple as that. Because without CFD, you will not be able to simulate f things like flow detachment. You will have a flow field that is very approximate. And when you have a flow field that is approximate and you have a very high power density in your fluid, this means your temperature field will be approximate. This is a reactor. This is actually the reactor that we will use for the uh, end zone sessions this week. This is a reactor where if you fail in simulating things like the flow detachment on the wall and you fail in predicting possible recirculation regions, it means you will fail in predicting that your vessel is melting. That fail, right? You don't want to have that. So people since 2012, 11, pretty much, Manu, 2012, they realize we need CFD. And if you need CFD, you cannot use legacy codes like trace. Um, but if you need, if you have molten salt reactor, you don't only need CFD, and you want to do, uh, you know, reactor analysis and neutronics. And this thing is very tightly coupled because uh, it's moving fluid, you have the heat transfer that is directly in the fluid, so there is no delay in the heating of the thing. Plus you have precursors, delayed neutron precursors that move around. And, uh, well, OpenFOAM was very good, good for that because you already had very good CFD tools. RANS, LES, you had both of them. Even DNS if you want, but it would be a bit of an overkill. And uh, adding diffusion, as I said before, is if you wanted one group that honestly for transients is good enough, is this equation, as simple as that. And if you want to add precursors, you have a relatively simple equation, derivative over time. SP is a fancy way in, sorry, in open form to say source. So you have precursors, you have lambda multi uh, decay constants multiplied by the precursors, you have the neutron scores that comes from uh, neutronics, you have a divergence, why a divergence? Because these precursors are moving around, so you have to feed the solver with the velocity coming from CFD and move the precursors according to this velocity. And you have Laplacian, why Laplacian? Well, because these precursors, they diffuse. So any you know, species transport, you will always find at least uh, a divergence. Most of the time, if you cannot neglect it, the Laplacian, a derivative over time. Sometimes, like in this case, a source. Why a source? Well, because precursors are created by fission. And you can understand that it was not a difficult equation to implement. Once you know the equation, implementing in open form was not difficult. So doing um, MSFR analysis with open form was kind of a low hanging fruit. And with, th with that, I don't wanna say that what people did was easy. They had to have the intuition about using open form for that. And again, it was back in 2011. People were used to legacy codes. It was very normal to use trace and relap. And you spoke about open form and people were like, what's that? Um, and it required people to make research, realize there is a tool out there that you can use. It was very good quality that was very little used in nuclear. Uh, so I, I must give all the credit to those people that realized we could use it. 
Uh, and once they realized they could use it, it was for them a very low hanging fruit to get very nice simulation that at that time was surprising because people were absolutely not used to this kind of simulations. It was, whoa. Um, I will skip this one. You can do more advanced things with open form. You have things like radiative heat transfer. This is a simulation, sorry again. This is a simulation of the dump tanks in molten salt reactors. Molten salt reactors, you can dump your salt into critically safe tanks and uh, cool them. And this was a simulation of natural convection in the tanks and radiative heat transfer towards the external of the uh, hot room. So these are things you can do with open phone, which is pretty cool. And again, it comes from the fact that you have a large library and you have in there things like radiative transfer. If you have to develop from scratch, it's a long way to go. Um, very cool one, also this one. And uh, also in this case, it was probably the first time people did it. This was a direct coupling between discrete element method and serpent. Um, this was a simulation of the approach to criticality. What you see here, uh, it's low, but you will see it. It's the K effective increasing with the pep loading of the pebbles. Uh, so it was direct coupling between DEM, discrete element method, in open form, and serpent. It was done at UC Berkeley in 2015. And again, you will see people doing this today, but this was done eight years ago. So keep in mind the time scale. And once again, why it was so early? Well, because open form gave everything. It gave discrete element. And well, luckily, serpent people had developed a multi-physics interface for open form. Um, and that's the advantage of having a large community. Most of the time you find functionalities. Oh, it's there, okay. Um, then I have three slides which I mostly will skip because we will discuss this later uh, in this week. So one is about gen form. So these are the tools I mentioned starting from 2015, people starting more or less people starting to put together open form based applications that survived, that are maintained regularly, uh, uh, updated by um, a research group or an institution. One is GenFOM. Um, as far as I am aware of, it was the first attempt for a general multi-physics solver for reactor analysis. It has been used for several things from, you know, this is a simulation of the molten salt reactor experiments, this is core flowering in a sodium fast reactor. You remember before I mentioned about dynamics, dynamic meshes, mesh deformations, but this is something you can do with open form. You can literally deform your mesh to simulate uh, reactivity feedbacks. You can do two-phase flow, thanks to open form. Um, you can do um, very strange reactors like the Argonaut reactors. Um, they will discuss more GenFOM later this week. Um, Offbeat, same thing. Offbeat was born uh, three, four years later compared to GenFOM, uh, which makes it so that inside Offbeat we threw everything we had learned. So in my perspective, it's a better quality code. It's also a bit smaller. Um, it was born for field behavior. Uh, we click quickly realized, as I said before, that you can do more than that. And to give you an idea on how powerful and useful open form has been, this went from a you know very strange idea of using finite volumes for thermal mechanics to a multi-dimensional solver for field behavior that is now included in several Euraton projects. It's actually very central into the Opera HPC project that was recently uh, funded by Euratom. And that happened in five years. So it was very, very quick. You know, this five plus five years rule, yeah, maybe a li little bit less for offbeat. Why was it so quick? Uh, well, several benefits out of using open form. Probably Alessandro can comment more on that because Alessandro has been the lead developer of offbeat. He is the PhD student. He was the PhD student that created it and brought it to success and is now the lead developer and maintainer of the code. Uh, but definitely something that helped is the functionalities you have there. Like, you know, you have the cladding and you have the fuel. How do you couple them if you want to use unstructured meshes? 
or you need some magic in between, right? Well, the magic exists in open formats called AMI, uh, Arbitrary Mesh Interface. So you don't have to develop that from scratch. If you have to develop that from scratch, you probably would need another PhD. So again, having uh, functionalities like that is extremely helpful. And uh, I mentioned before these, you know, 10 to 20,000 engineers working on open form. Well, that helped a lot because we found out very soon that solid for form existed. So this library maintained by the University of Dublin, and that was instrumental to being able to develop offbeat in a very quick and timely manner. Last one, I'm not sure I'm qualified to comment this, so I think I can let Stefan uh, discuss this and I'm giving him the uh, rest of the lecture today. Thank you, Carlo. Yeah, so the last tool, uh, again, we will detail much more on uh, Thursday is containment foam. It has started as a tool to analyze gas mixing in a large dry containment. We were using pretty much the standard functionality that OpenFOAM was giving us, plus some tailoring towards the conditions that we were expecting. And from that we learned that we need to take care of more physics like phase change, condensation phenomena, um, thermal radiation, so we put in some Monte Carlo transport solver. We um, understood that also we have to, to um, consider the interaction of safety systems or technical components with the flow, the interaction of uh, the operators, the activation of safety systems and so on. So all this led to a library which is, I think, still based a lot on the standard functionalities of uh, CFD, but also contains a lot of um, extra features. And again, here we, we benefited a lot as you, as you learn from what's available in OpenFOAM, um, all the solver and models which we could take as a blueprint for starting to develop our own uh, functionalities, turbulence models, the, the particle transport library that helped us with the photon transport in the Monte Carlo solver, um, the general parallelization of OpenFOAM that will allow us to run this kind of, uh, let's say, large problems as you see here, the Vatel model containment with roughly um, 650 meter cube and I think something like uh, 5 million cells. So uh, I will take uh, Carlos' conclusion here. Uh, I think it's a pretty enthusiastic conclusion I, I'm completely sharing. Uh, with a bit of ingenuity and imagination you can do pretty much everything with open foam. Um, of course, there are a few buts, but at the end, uh, if you spend some time, you will discover that um, nearly everything is possible. To detail on this, I will uh, try to answer a bunch of questions in the next 45 minutes um, that probably come up in your minds. Um, the most prominent one, what is the effort of doing this? Um, but also, how can I approach such a problem? which kind of competencies do I need, uh, what will be the quality of the results that I, I'm obtaining, and also what about the license-related uh, issues. And to address the first question, how to approach the problem, we will consider a, a kind of hypothetical reactor. Um, it's a multi-physics problem, so we will run for thermofluid dynamics, for thermomechanics and um, neutron physics. So we have a monolithic block core here with some coolant channels, similar to something what you um, expect for one of the microreactors that are coming up recently. It has a lower plenum, an upper plenum, and a reflector around it. And we want to model the thermal hydraulics coupled with 3D neutron kinetics here, so a classical reactor dynamics problem. So the way to approach the problem is to split up it into um, different physics and domains. So we will have, of course, a coolant domain where we are mostly interested in the heat transfer from the solid structures uh, to the coolant and then the transport of the heat by the coolant. We will have the solid structures, so the, um, the um, fuel and also the moderator, the um, reflector materials. and um, we will have, of course, a neutronic domain which covers both of them to some extent to consider the neutron balance. So we will take those and, um, of 
course have to create a mesh for all of them. And when it comes to the uh, fluid and the solid structures, Carl already mentioned, uh, we can of course go for the brute force way, discretize all these, um, resolve the fine geometry, all the coolant tubes, but of course this would be far too expensive for engineering analysis. So the major approach here is to go for um, a porous model, meaning homogenize um, the fluid and also the structures within a cell. So we have a cell which shares uh, fluid and structure to some extent. And for the neutronics, of course, we will uh, again need a mesh which um, overlaps uh, both domains. We will define the fields that we have to consider for. So in the neutronic mesh, on the neutronic domain, this is um, primarily the fluxes and the power, what we are solving for, and the cross-section and delayed neutron precursors, which we input. In the coolant domain, we um, will solve for pressure, velocity, temperature, maybe also turbulent quantities, uh, turbulent kinetic energy, eddy frequency, and so on. And as input, we give the thermophysical properties. And in the solid structures, um, we solve for the temperature and we input the thermophysical properties again. So what you see here, mesh plus fields, this gives us more or less the data we, um, we are having to handle. And uh, we also add the equations we want to solve. So for the neutron domain, uh, simply we consider some neutron diffusion and decay and production of um, precursors for the delayed neutrons. On the fluid domain, it will be the Runs equations or unsteady Runs equations. Um, Let's solve for the fluid, and on the solid domain, we will simply have a heat a conduction equation, both, uh, of course, uh, either in a um, resolved or porous uh, media formulation. So with this, we have already a kind of base structure for our problem, which we can consider to build um, the solver. So we will um, set up three classes, uh, one class um, mimicking the neutron in physics, another one for the coolant, and uh, the last for the solid mechanics. All of these classes, they have uh, inputs, primarily the temperatures. So for the neutronics, we need the temperatures in the uh, liquid, in the coolant, as well as in the structure to compute the cross-sections and get the neutron flux. In the coolant cl uh, class, we will um, consider the reactor power um, as a heat source, but also we will have the heat transfer from the solid structures, which um, the, the fuel material itself, which will transfer the heat to the coolant. And with all this, we get um, the output variables that we are desiring. So the reactor power, the coolant temperatures, or the coolant heat up in the core, and the solid temperatures. So of course, um, the meshes or the domains, they are partly overlapping, but they will not share the same mesh, so we will have some functionality in open form, the mesh to mesh mapping that will allow us to transfer information from each class to another one using some interpolation schemes, for example. So all this is there, um, the, the mesh to mesh mapping, and uh, we can simply utilize it for our problem. So with this, we have a kind of a blueprint of uh, such a problem. And in reality, it's a bit more um, complicated than what we line out. So, um, for example, if we're in a porous media formulation, of course, we have to find some way to distribute the power between um, the solids and the fluids. So here, um, we have to find a way to, to do it. And also, we, um, we cannot simply map temperatures between the domains, but we somehow have to find the heat fluxes to conserve the energy between the different domains. So at the end, this is something to think about. It's um, definitely doable, and um, of course, the available features um, and, and solvers, they will help us on, on how to do it. So um, at the end, we will also have to define some uh, nested subclasses um, that will give us all the information that we are needing, something like a cross-section, uh, thermophysical properties, heat transfer correlation, pressure drop correlations, and so on. Once we have these three classes, we can uh, integrate them in a solver algorithm. So um, at the end, we create some instances of the neutronics class, of the solid class, the coolant class. We um, proceed with a time loop where we um, solve all the domains of physics uh, one by one. 
in a segregated manner. Um, for some of them, we can have some kind of inner iterations, for example, here to converge on the uh, solid and fluid temperature and the heat transfer between those um, domains. And we can also have some outer iterations within a time step to converge on um, all the uh, physics. And with this, we can advance our problem in time. So this is a general um, approach how to uh, do it, and you will see pretty much this is what we have in uh, all the tools that uh, you will see this week. Let's briefly talk about the license. So OpenFOAM is for free um, in terms of the license, so it's um, distributed under the GNU public license version 3, which is a strong copy license. Um, for those of you who don't know much about this, Actually, it means that you're free to do with the software whatever you want. Uh, the only limitation is that um, the license will automatically affect any kind of derivative work and you cannot um, modify it. So whenever you develop something based on OpenFOAM, it will automatically become licensed under the GPL version 3. And that means whenever you want to share it with some colleague, it's not possible just to give an executable, but you will also have to share the source code. This is something which is pretty advantageous for um, collaborative work, for science, um, academia, for teaching, since you can just base on something that others provided you. Um, you can avoid duplication of work, in particular with the, for the very basic functionalities. But at the end also this can be a bit of a burden for commercial players in the field that um, will not uh, be able to put much investments in terms of money or manpower to um, the maintenance and also the development of such tools. So here a positive example of course is uh, ESI is one of the maintainers of OpenFOAM. They um, spend a lot of efforts on further developing and maintaining um, this toolbox, but also other companies, they are using um, OpenFOAM and partly release features that they develop uh, to the community, report during the workshops, and um, by this contribute to OpenFOAM. The workflow in OpenFOAM is pretty much um, what you know in many modern engineering softwares like uh, FEM, for example. So we start defining our problem in terms of the geometry we want to solve for, the computational domain we are considering. Then we discretize this domain into a mesh, um, which has, let's say, an internal mesh, the fields we are solving for, and a boundary mesh, which um, holds our boundary conditions. Proceed with the setup, where we give boundary conditions to the boundaries, uh, initial values to the internal field. We select the models we want to include, the model equations we want to solve, the numerical schemes, methods, and parameters for our solution. And once we are done with this, um, we can dump things on a computer or cluster infrastructure, um, get the solution, and proceed with a post-processing evaluation and most likely repeating the step. So um, to talk a bit about downsides, um, there's no graphical user interface, at least no official generic graphical user interface of OpenFORM. And this simply inherits from the fact that OpenFOAM um, can be easily customized for many things and as soon as you do this, all those new features, they will not be reflected at all in the user interface. So you will see that there are some uh, specific GUIs um, for the various functionalities. For example, there's a commercial one maintained by ESI. Oh, I will also show you on Thursday that we do uh, develop a GUI for containment foam to ease setup processes, but this is something that is very specific for a particular purpose and not, uh, let's say, in a generic way to get hands-on open form. When it comes to the um, geometry creation and the meshing, um, but also post-processing, we heavily rely on non-open form functions or codes. So, for example, for the geometry, one could use uh, open software like FreeCAD to create the geometry. For the meshing, we can use um, GMesh or CF Mesh or Snappy Hex Mesh, which is shipped with OpenFOAM. Post processing, this will be a ParaView, most likely, but uh, there are also converters that give you um, possibilities to do some command line post processing um, or export data in VDK and do in, in any kind of other post processing tool. Uh, generally, 
what my feeling is that when it comes to geometry and meshing, um, many people still rely heavily on proprietary tools um, since they are much more powerful and easy to use than what we see in the open, form, uh, in the open source uh, domain. So here, let's say there are a lot of powerful meshes that can simplify your workflow that can uh, ease the, the meshing procedure and um, at the end speed up your work a lot and many people are still using this. There's one point which I personally do not see as a, as a drawback. This is uh, OpenForm is only running under Linux, so there were some attempts to do it under Windows, but most likely you will run in Linux, you will lose um, Windows Linux subsystem or a direct uh, Linux distribution to install and, and run it. And also if you go to high performance computing infrastructures, all of them run under Linux and you will have more or less the same environment to do it. Uh, it will allow you to do um, nice scripting around OpenFORM uh, to automize repetitive workflows, to um, do parametric studies easily. So at this and I would not see it as a downside, but of course for those people who are used to run things under Windows, uh, have a nice uh, graphical user interface, they will have to learn a bit how to do things uh, in the terminal and Linux. Something that's still not really optimal in OpenFORM is the documentation. So there have been some attempts in the community, in particular driven by ESI, to consolidate all this. There's a nice tutorial wiki, some nice training series that you can follow uh, to discover um, the various aspects of OpenFORM. There's a book, of course, um, that has been written by the OpenForm Foundation. There's another book, which is, uh, I think, in Springer, on the finite volume method with OpenForm. Pretty good books. Um, but at the end, what you will see whenever you try to approach um, a kind of problem is that there will be a gap here and there that you have to fill yourself. There's no hotline you can call, but uh, at the end, you can uh, go to CFD online or those uh, user forums post your questions or search for the, uh, the entries and try to find a solution to that specific uh, question that you're having. So all in all, OpenFORM has a quite steep learning curve. I remember myself when I started it six or seven years ago, it was pretty hard to get a hand on. So many questions coming up at the same time and it was very hard to answer them. But when I could really recommend you is not try to use it as a black box. So try to take a tutorial, just modify a line and, and uh, make it adopt to your case. Of course, this is the, the way to go, but at the end, try to understand what is specified, what do these things mean, and are they applicable to my personal um, case or not. And then try to uh, learn from similar cases and other tutorials, what are the options and uh, which one fits, fits best to the problem. The advantages are on hand, and Carlo has, has shown a lot of them. Uh, I mean, OpenFORM is transparent. There's nothing hidden inside. If you want to see what a specific functionality does, you can simply open the source code. You can see if the equations fit what you expect. And if not, you can just adopt it, recompile, and use this functionality for your own purpose. So to conclude, saying um, it's a very nice way of integrating application uh, development together in uh, this workflow. Um, Carlo already mentioned a bit about the structure of the base library in OpenFORM. It's a very complete library holding all the things we need um, for uh, solving matrices, uh, discretization, uh, the solution or solvers for linear systems, uh, the dense matrix algebra. You can solve ordinary differential equations. Um, there's a lot of functionality for um, handling meshes, um, for the import of meshes, for deformation manipulation of meshes, uh, the mesh-to-mesh -mesh projection, um, octree-based mesh search. Uh, we have a Lagrangian library for particle transport. We have um, Monte Carlo methods. Even things for reduced order modeling, like uh, proper orthogonal de decomposition. It's not there in any uh, distribution of OpenFORM, but uh, it's in OpenFORM Extend, and it can be ported to other ones. Um, there's functionality for coupling um, applications in OpenFORM itself. So if you want to go for conjugate heat transfer, for example, you can couple a fluid solver with a uh, structure energy equation solver. Um, there's functionality for coupling OpenFORM to external codes, uh, for example, a file-based coupler in OpenFORM, the ESI version. 
but also third-party projects like uh, Precise by the Technical University in Munich, which have, let's say, designed a kind of generic um, code coupling adapter where I want, just have to define um, an interface to the third-party code, use the adapter of OpenFoam and the Precise coupling scheme to bring things together. And there's much more to explore, just uh, take your time to uh, walk through the source directory, the applications directory uh, in OpenFoam and you will find a lot of useful things. OpenFoam is object-oriented data encapsulation, uh, multi-level API, so all this uh, has already been presented. OpenFoam as a general CFD code relies on the finite volume method, which um, actually says that we take our computational domain and split it up into um, a finite number of uh, small volumes. It's a quite flexible man um, thing, so we can um, more or less discretize any kind of geometry. It's a scalable, you can use as many as possible um, computational cells. It's pretty much intuitive for an engineer. So as you see here, we have, um, let's say, our solution quantities like uh, the pressure, the temperature, whatever, on the cell centers. And we have values on the phases that describe the fluxes from one cell into another one. We will integrate the conservation equations over the finite volume, so it's a conservative formulation. It's ideal for uh, convection-driven problems like CFD, and more or less what I know, it's um, the method which is widely used for um, CFD in both the academic codes, the open source codes, and also commercial codes. It's uh, quite okay still for diffusion problems, thermal mechanics, uh, neutron diffusion, and um, I think one benefit here is that uh, each of those cells we are having here, the finite volume cells, just has a, a small number of neighboring cells, so we yield uh, um, a sparse diagonally dominant matrix which can be easily inverted and allows us for a fast and efficient solution. On the downside, um, meshing is, uh, I would say, an art of its own. So here we uh, have to produce good quality meshes, um, good quality in terms of a number of criteria, something like non-orthogonality, skewness, aspect ratio, growth ratios, and so on. So all these factors will determine whether the solution is converging, diverging, um, giving us um, accurate results. We will have a lot of uh, numerical diffusion or instabilities. Um, it's maximum second order accurate in space, so if we want to have some higher accuracy at the end, this comes at the cost of refining the mesh. Um, it has first order elements with flat faces, so at the end if we have curved surfaces, of course, uh, again, we need to compensate this with a higher resolution. Um, and uh, yeah, last but not least, this is not a con, this is general for um, any kind of uh, computing software. We have to be familiar with the, the concepts behind, so we have to know about solving partial differential equations, uh, about creating the geometry, meshing it, uh, discretizing things, um, and obtain a linear solution. So OpenFoam, or generally the finite volume method, allows us to use uh, unstructured meshes, which can have a kind of uh, arbitrary um, geometry, so we can go from tetrahedrons, hexahedrons, but even up to um, polyhedrons with uh, any number of uh, faces, which allows us to uh, actually handle any kind of uh, geometry that uh, we have in, um, let's say, non-standard, non-traditional reactor designs and, and components. So what you see here um, on the right side, the, the sodium reactor core, where we have hexagonal fuel elements, so also on the left side, some something in between a spherical and a cylindrical core. Um, these sort of things, they can be done without the limitations we would have from Cartesian coordinates or um, cylindrical coordinates. Generally, since it's finite volume, uh, all cells are three-dimensional, so um, it's not so easy to do a 1D or 2D mesh in open foam. There are some tricks to do it, basically working on uh, the boundary conditions. But at the end, in some applications where we want to do some 1D um, calculations, something like um, having a thin gap to bridge or computing uh, a pipe. Um, of course, we have to develop uh, case by case uh, a solution on that. 
Using unstructured meshes is, um, let's say, really flexible, but on the other hand has a bit uh, higher computational footprint like uh, dimensioned Cartesian or cylindrical meshes. At the end, um, in those meshes, we uh, have a mesh index which we can sweep through and always identify the neighboring cells to um, our present cell. Uh, in these unstructured meshes, actually, we don't know in advance how many neighbors a cell has. So at the end, what we have to do is store a connectivity matrix that gives us this information. And this will, of course, uh, require some extra effort in storing the information, calculating the information, and so on. OpenFORM uses the operator splitting approach, which is actually meaning that we will um, solve uh, for each equation a separate matrix and then use fixed point iteration to converge it. Um, and we have some coupling terms in the equations, uh, for example, like density, um, that uh, may treat it explicitly. This has a number of advantages and disadvantages. You can just look up the literature, you will find tons of papers, uh, which will probably always show uh, an optimal solution for a specific case. But what we can, can just uh, conclude here is say, um, on the positive side, of course, it's easier to, um, to uh, precondition a, mat uh, a single matrix for a single equation uh, to choose the, the right solution method um, if it is just one equation. Um, we don't have to do all things at once, so we can have them one by one, and this makes it much easier to develop and debug things, and we can just focus on a single equation at a time. On the downside, this may be um, less robust for um, a weakly coupled problem or strongly nonlinear problems. So if you, for example, consider shocks, these sort of things may work better in a coupled solver. And sometimes we will have to um, yeah, lose some numerical tricks to, to get a stable a solution. But yeah, on the other hand, um, for uh, having smaller matrices, the, the requirements on the computational sides are lower. And yeah, all these things uh, probably will depend on the case that you, that you want to use. There have been some attempts in OpenFOAM to um, also use some block coupled solvers. Uh, I think in the OpenFOAM Extend project, they um, managed to solve for temperature even in coupled regions in a single matrix. But still, um, the work in OpenFOAM heavily relies on operator splitting. OpenFORM is parallelized using uh, the do domain decomposition approach of the message passing interface that actually means we uh, split up our computational mesh into mesh partitions. And in between these partitions, we have processor patches where we exchange um, the solution. And this can scale up to 1,000 uh, of CPU cores, um, simply following a rule of thumb saying 20 to 30,000 cells per core scale well. If we go below, um, the performance decreases. It's still possible to do it. And going up, of course, um, we will have to accept longer computation times. This means if we have a small problem, of course, we cannot just dump a thousand cores on it and get it solved efficiently, but we somehow have to um, adopt the um, parallelization to the problem size itself. There are some bottlenecks which are common for most of the FEM and uh, F VM solvers um, just related to the data structure. I don't want to go much in detail, but at the end this will lead to um, a lot of um, data exchange between the core and the memory. So let's say this will be a bottleneck um, for the speed up and also the I.O. Um, will be a bit limiting for larger problems. Since OpenFOAM has a own a way of storing data in these dictionary files you will see later. So this is pretty flexible for um, setting up a case, um, reading the case information, but at the end when it comes to large, large runs with a lot of um, cores, then collecting this data and writing it in this file structure is uh, less efficient. There have been some approaches done to, um, to add HDF5 format to OpenFORM to improve this. And uh, also in the High Performance Computing Technical Committee at OpenFORM, there are a lot of um, people working together to uh, overcome these limitations, um, to, let's say, provide an interface to our linear algebra solvers, um, to implement the PETSI library, for example. There's some work done by NVIDIA to uh, offload some of the um, uh, matrix solutions to the GPUs, uh, and also there's a European 
Horizon 2020 project called Exafoam, which uh, tries to bring OpenFOAM on massively parallel computing architectures. So these are approaches, attempts, try to overcome the limitations that we have here. And um, if you look at the releases of uh, OpenFOAM, you will here and there find some um, of the the um, outcomes of these projects already implemented in, in the standard um, distribution. Last but not least, uh, let's talk a bit about computational um, requirements. So uh, remember the rule of thumb, something like 20, 30,000 mesh cells per CPU core can be done. That means if we go for um, a standard two-dimensional runs simulation, which typically has a number of 100,000 CPU cells. We can do that on a workstation with 6 to 16 cores. It's easily possible. If you go for 3D cases, uh, which can range between 100,000 and several million cells, we can easily um, use this on uh, a medium-sized cluster. And uh, if we look at for example for coarse mesh thermohydraulics, neutron diffusion on um, these kind of uh, Porous media approaches, and for full core, we will have a few hundred thousand to a few million cells, uh, which is something that can be solved on uh, on a workstation, desktop computer, laptop, depending on, on the computation time that we can accept. For the runtime, of course, uh, it's much easier to obtain steady state solutions um, if we can scale up the problem to, um, let's say, the optimal number of CPU cores. This can be in between minutes to uh, a few hours. If you go for long-running, um, time-dependent problems, uh, this can be easily for a week. And to give you some ideas of, of uh, the analysis we are doing with containment form, um, typically our validation cases, they range um, from one hour transient time to two hours. And this is something we can do in between days to week. If we go for, um, let's say, a full-scale technical application um, where we have uh, huge meshes, um, and also to consider long um, transient times, like several hours, this can easily go up uh, to weeks or even months computing time that uh, is to be spent. For the memory, um, you have to remember we store a number of fields for each cell. So typically for a run simulation, this is something like 10 fields, pressure, temperature, the velocity, turbulent quantities. Um, so. If we multiply this by the number of cells, we come up with something like a gigabyte for one million cells. If we do something more multi-physics, uh, like uh, discrete ordinate methods, um, where we have to store the information for the solid angles, then this can easily um, be multiplied by an order of magnitude or two, so um, that we can get easily a number of 100 megabytes, uh, gigabytes per million cells. So with this, I'm at the end of uh, this lecture. I hope we uh, showed you a bit uh, our enthusiasm in open form. Uh, you learned how to approach a problem with this uh, toolbox. Um, you got some ideas of what you can do, um, what are the pros and cons. I hope you also saw that it's, um, let's say, not always a low-hanging fruit. So. Um, at the end, what you pay is um, with time, so you have to prepare yourself to understand not just the problem you want to solve, but also the, the tools uh, that you can use to do it. And um, when you do it, of course, uh, at the end, many things will become possible. Thank you. Questions to our lectures? Yeah, please go ahead. I think we should use microphone. Do we have microphones? So people, so people online can also hear and your questions. I just want to know uh, if there is any tutorial or uh, solver which have that neutronic equations already uh, there uh, to solve for the 
neutronic cells are like flux or something in open form already existing because the, in the presentation there comes at some point that solve neutronics then solve solid and then solve coolant uh, equations um so um Within open form, as distributed, you will not get any neutronics. You will have to look at contributions from the community. Um, I believe the only neutronics capable solver that is open access is GenFoam, uh, which is the solver that we have been developed at EPFL, PSI, now Texas A&M. Solver is there, is accessible. Um, if you can I actually go online with this computer? Yeah? Uh, let me try something. This is something I will present more later this week, but I still want to answer your question. So if you search for GenFOM, GitLab, you will immediately find it's open access, so you can, you'll find it there. Um, so this is a community contribution, so it is a, nothing but a very complicated application of open form. Um, inside you find the source, uh, you find documentation, and you find the tutorials. Now the tutorials, you have to understand it's um, open form style. Meaning, it's a bit more commented than open form. Basic open form, you will find essentially no comments, and they hope you will understand. Since GenFOM is a complicated tool, we have documentation. So we have a description, we have a Doxygen documentation that get guides you through GenFOM. We'll give you, tell you how to compile, pre-process, running, post-process. We'll give you basic information about neutronics, thermal hydraulics. For instance, if you go to neutronics, you will get information about how it works. And if you go to where I was, <coughs> tutorials, you will find a number of tutorials. Um, I'm thinking about one that makes sense for neutronics, probably small ESFR. This is a 3D European sodium fast reactor. <coughs> and you will find a description of the tutorial, and you will find an all run that will tell you what's going on. Um, so there is basic information. There is no video tutorial on how to do that. <coughs> this is something we will do on Wednesday. We will go through how to use this thing. Now, the general thing about using community-driven um, developments is that we always suggest, first of all, learn how to use open form. If you learn how to use open form and even though the resources are a bit scattered, they are there. There is significant documentation online. It's just a bit spread out. But if you spend some time, you will find it. Um, and in this webinar series that we did for the IAEA, we provide a general introduction to open form, and especially we provide an introduction to a lot of resources that you can use. So the overall idea of that webinar series was to give um, keywords and references to start using OpenFOAM. So since this, you know, this um, documentation is a bit scattered, we felt like it's important to give people a place where they can find all these websites and links and keywords to search for. So if you look at the IAEA OpenFOAM uh, online uh, course, there's a lot about that. Once you know how to use OpenFOAM, GenFOAM is nothing but a complicated application of open form. Uh, disadvantage is complicated. Advantage, there is a documentation and tutorials that you normally do not find in open form solvers. So we actually spent some time, you know, commenting all the tutorials, explaining how to approach them, providing them with all run files. And all run is a bash script that it tells you all the steps, like creating a mesh, running the solver, changing this dictionary, and these kind of things. So, Video tutorial might be coming soon, but not there yet. But there are significant uh, resources available uh, to introduce you to the thing. 
but the coming days I will get back to this in much more details. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. We have a question from, from online participants yeah. and from, from Algeria. And here we have Abdel, Abdel Ghani Bo, Borenane. Could you just, your micro, you are muted. Could you unmute your microphone, Abdel Ghani? Yes, yes. C can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Please yeah. go ahead with your question. Thank you, thank you. My question is basically around the idea that uh, the open form is, uh, most often use it for a sort of very complicated and complex simulation based on uh, based on <coughs> mathematical formula, which may, might need, I mean, a lot of computation. So the question might be about the validity of working with such with open form with for a, with a single core or a sequential programming instead of parallel programming. So I imagine that it's for reactor for reactor analysis and so on. It's a very complicated task that needs many computational. I mean, yeah, computational uh, resources. So. Does working with uh, the simple sequ sequential programming might be uh, lead to, I mean, designing a sort of state of the art stuff that we might need in the field, or just uh, just of sort of simple stuff until we use parallel programming? Um, is this somehow clear? I mean, be because there is sort of. You know the, co the the complexity of the, the equations and the, the mathematical formula that we use to to design the reactor, the reactor and simulate its behavior. So using sort of uh, simple sequential program because you have talking about MPI massive passing interface and the high performance computing, the NVIDIA involvement in this. So working just in a simple way with your with your with your PC with your uh, traditional way of doing programming, is it beneficial or to do? I mean, stuff that are beneficial to the field, to the real, to the real advancement. We need uh, high performance stuff. We need sort of uh, GPUs and parallel programming for open form in order to do something of high value. Do you mean that like instead of wasting time of trying to parallelize and buy new GPUs and clusters, we just put more efforts on the traditional sequential program? Is it? Yeah, is the traditional way of doing it really valid to do something beneficial for the field? Because I imagine it's very complicated task. It needs a lot of computation. I yeah, mean, yeah, understand. Yeah, thank you. Task. We understand. I I think Stefan okay. can answer because he is um, parallel. No? We can. It's, it's okay. I mean, we can we, we can both okay. give our perspective. I think it's it's not an obvious question what you ask. I can tell you what uh, I see people are doing around me, and uh, there is a general consensus that if we want to license advanced reactors, uh, we might need tools that go beyond legacy tools. Um, this is the reason why in Europe and now in the US we have been developing open form based tools and this is the reason why in the, the US has invested significant money developing MOOCs. Um, so I think there is a consensus in the community that these tools are important. That doesn't mean that you cannot do research without them. So first of all, even with these tools you don't necessarily need HPC resources. You look at the tutorials in GenFOAM, we have 3D reactor analysis in there and you can run it on a laptop. No problem at all. It's going to run in minutes in a laptop. So you can do the equivalent of what was done with system <coughs> tools using OpenFOAM. I mean, I think the nice thing about these new tools is that you can pretty much decide how computationally expensive you want to be. If you want to stay coarse mesh using correlations, you are absolutely free to do that. And most of the time you will get solutions that are, you know, compared to a CFD solution, uh, take a reactor core, take a fast reactor. If you want to do a CFD solution or you do a coarse mesh simulation with uh, correlations, 
uh, most likely the regulator is going to prefer the correlations and the porous medium approach and will not like the CFD. So I would say that uh, going for high fidelity, high HPC, parallel simulation is not a must. We just know that it can be useful and we don't want to find ourselves in five years when we license reactors that, oops, we cannot simulate them. So we need to, you know, uh, keep on progressing. But to me, that doesn't mean you cannot use uh, traditional approaches, either on legacy tools or on these new tools. Traditional approaches are valid, especially when they come with correlations that have been verified and validated and improved through several years. That is my very personal perspective, so Stefan. Yeah, I can also give a personal view on that. Um, since I'm not an expert, uh, actually, in all this high-performance um, programming, um, at the end, we choose OpenFOAM as a basis for, for our um, development, since it, it gave us most of the things um, that we need. And with this, we left a bit also the decision how the details in the, in the base libraries are done uh, to the community that is behind OpenFOAM. And, uh, I think as soon as there are new techniques being, um, let's say, settled in the community, also open form, the releases will reflect it and uh, things will develop in this direction. But for the moment, I would say it's a state of the art and uh, a solid basis to, to build on. Well, that's the, the trivial reason for, for approaching this. <coughs> yeah, I, I, if I can, just one thing, I think I, you touched something that is actually, I forgot to mention, that we probably implied all the time is that if you use open form, you don't need to be an expert in numerical analysis or <coughs> any part, you know, you most likely you don't even need to know how to discretize or you don't need to know how to solve a linear matrix. The more you know, the more proficient you will be, the more research you will be able to do using that tool. But the fact that it is object-oriented, it also means that most of the classes are, it's a multi-layer library, so you can stay at the very top and just throw in equations, not knowing anything about the discretization and solution. Or, you know, the deeper you go, if you are an expert in, you might be an expert in linear uh, system solution, not in nuclear engineering, and you would still be able to touch those classes and not touch the rest. So the way it's been programmed, and that's the whole benefits of object-oriented programming, is that you're not required to touch all of it. You touch what you can, you touch what you know. And the rest, you trust it. You have to have a basic knowledge, because of course when you solve it, if you have no idea what a linear system is, it's not going to be easy. But you don't need to be an expert on that. So I think this is an advantage of these new libraries. They allow you to focus on what you know. Frankly, I doubt if, if my comment is that you don't have to be an expert if you only... <laughs> well, you don't need to be a mathematician. But, but continue with the par parallelizations versus, you know, the, the sequential programming. Usually, with, you, you need several... Uh, you don't need only calculate one transient and that's all. You need many, many variations. So what if you run immediately, like, 64 transients with different initial or, like, boundary conditions instead of trying to parallelize one. It's per CPU, it's more effective, eh? Yes, it's, okay. oh, it's very effective. It's just uh, sometimes you have no choice, right? Sometimes if you want to have some very complicated simulation, you so have there is to always trade-off, so of it's course <coughs> it allows you to do but mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thank you. We have question. There I was a it was question up there somewhere. Here? I said, no? Over there? Not? Okay, please. Please go. Oh, yes. Then you. Uh, hi. Uh, which uh, cross section library you, uh, do you use for neutron diffusion? Anything we can. Uh, we have used the NDF, we have used Jeff. You can use whatever you want. and. How you prepare the cross sections? If you want, if you need multi-group cross sections, uh, historically we have used a lot of serpent. We are trying to use more and more OpenMC for obvious reasons because we're speaking about open source here. Um, I know people that have used Dragon for that, so there's 
there's a whole set of tools. We don't recommend anything specific. We have, like in Genform, we have routines to translate output of OpenNC and of Serpent into open form, Genform readable input. So you will find utilities for those two tools. But uh, it's fairly quick to do it for any tools you want. Okay, thank you. There's a question up there. Thank you for presentation. I would you like to ask about the data projection. In, in the each physics, uh, the mesh dance is the same as uh, all, all of them, or their dance, the mesh density uh, different each other. Is well, it, it depends on how you want. You can do both. I can tell you, in Genfund, they are different. So we have a different mesh for neutronics, thermal hydraulics, and uh, thermal mechanics. They can be the same, but sometimes they are not. So we decided to let the user use different meshes. Sometimes because of different refinements. Sometimes you, because you don't want to solve the same region. Imagine you do thermal hydraulics and neutronics. Thermal hydraulics, you may want to do the entire primary circuit, and you don't want to solve the heat exchanger for neutronics, right? So it is different, and OpenFOAM has two or three different algorithms to do mesh-to-mesh -mesh projection. And the one that you use almost all the time is um, a conservative um, weighted uh, volume uh, algorithm. Essentially, it, it projects fields from one mesh to the other, making sure you don't lose power pretty much, or any extensive quantity. I understand. Uh, so uh, when you uh, calculate the division coefficient, for example, division parameters uh, in the neutronics calculation, um, do you use to any um, average or interpolation uh, method for the any specific volume for the neutronics? Uh, Again, out temperature. if you speak about generally open foam, you can do pretty much whatever you want. If you speak about gen foam, we allow the user to decide if they want to use, if you want to provide uh, an adjoint flux for weighting, you can provide and the, the tool will do the weighting for you. Um, you can even calculate the adjoint yourself because we have an adjoint solver. So. Open form, it's completely feasible. With gen form, it's implemented. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question in chat, which is, says, is the thermomechanical class of gen form a subset of of bit? If yes, is there any plans to merge of bit with gen form for multi-physics analysis? Uh, this is an incredibly good and timely question. We are discussing with Alessandro um, to find a way and a path forward to merge the libraries of GenFOAM and Offbeat. There is an obvious reason. You look at, I will show you. I think this is, we still have some time and this can be interesting. So if you look at the source code of GenFOAM, you will see classes. In there you have things like Multiphysics control, neutronics, thermal hydraulics, thermal mechanics. If you look at the main, um, the main pretty much inside is something called solve. And if you look at the solve, it mostly looks like this. If you are solving fluid mechanics, thermal hydraulics dot correct fluid mechanics. If you are at the final iteration, thermal hydraulics interpolate coupling fields, thermal hydraulic correct energy, and then you have things like thermal mechanics interpolate, thermal mechanics correct, neutronics deform mesh. Here you see the object oriented, right? You see that in principle you have a library and you have classes. And you have, for instance, you have a class that is called neutronics, and this class has functions that deform the mesh and solve for neutronics. So the old structure of GenFOAM, if you look at the, so this is GenFOAM. Uh, GenFOAM is pretty much 200 lines. And what's below are classes, so are functionalities. Once you embrace this approach of object-oriented, 
you realize that having in there something additional to that that says of bit dot initialize and of bit dot solve is kind of obvious. Why don't we do that? Well, because we didn't have the time to do that. So yeah, the objective is to try to uh, merge the two libraries, having separate classes that can do the old thing from, so we will try probably to get rid of the thermomechanic solver of Genfone, which is very primitive, and have a single library for all the functionalities, so we will have neutronics, good thermomechanics done with off-bit, uh, we have thermal hydraulics, uh, we have multi-physics control, and well, pretty much the idea is to have uh, a situation where Genform and Offbit are nothing but two complex examples of applications that you can build using that multi-physics library. So yeah, the idea is to merge the two things and uh, have something that is easier for us to maintain, more obvious to use for everybody, um, easier to document, um, and more sustainable overall as, as a solver. So yeah, good question. So I think we can accept the last question before we, we go for the lunch. Yeah, I have a short one. Is there any list of all the papers published uh, using these tools? GenFoam, Offbit, and the Containment Foam? That's a good question. We, there should. I don't think it's there anymore. There was, at some point, years ago, we started uh, a list of publication. I don't know where it is anymore. So actually, if you go, I'm sure, you know, if you go to, just to give a half answer, so if you go to the single tools on the GitLab, you will find publications. Uh, you go to related pages, and there should be a bibliography, and you find 11 of them. There's more. And if you go to Offbeat, probably they have the same thing. So you find publications uh, inside, at least the essential ones. So these 11 ones are those that include, uh, they're essentially a theory manual. They include all the theory behind, or 90% of it. So there is enough to cover the basics. It's probably a good idea for us to start creating a list. We started years ago in the frame of another initiative, uh, uh, open form, uh, special interest groups for n nuclear. We started compiling a list of publications. I think it's still there, but I'm not sure. Let me check. Um, and, uh, anyway, it's a good, good question also. Like Stefan suggested that we can make, a, in the Oncoria site, we can make a list of publications, also related publications. Oh, that could be a we good place, actually. Sure. Just for curiosity. I'm not sure it's still there. Oh, well, maybe. Nope. There used to be a publication list here. It's not there anymore, sorry about that. But it's a good idea, and I think we will try to make it happen. Okay, so now we just came to the lunch break, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then we start at 1.20, one hour later, a practical introduction to the open form. With Stefan. <coughs> I believe the lunch is the same place where we have a coffee in the cafeteria. <laughs>